actually has this amazing research, research portfolio that he does sort of very tried and true economics. <laughs> He's written what I think is probably one of the most important papers on ecosystem services and certainly one of the most thought-provoking papers on ecosystem services. Um, and he also does histories um, and sort of this more humanities bent. And uh, I, I was very fortunate to be at a meeting a few months ago where I got to see an earlier version of this talk or th this talk. Um, and I actually grabbed Spencer at that meeting. And this is, this is a history talk. And I grabbed Spencer at that meeting and said, you've got to come to Yale and give this talk because I, I, I just think our community will be so interested in what Spencer has to say here. So I'm going to turn it over to Spencer. Thank you so much, Eli. Um, yes, a lot of the figures I'm going to be talking about today are uh, closely associated with Yale. So this is the, the perfect place. I'm coming in right to, uh, to their home turf to talk about this. I'll be interested in your perspective on the history and the, the policy debates that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, the field of environmental economics was already established as a going concern, but it announced itself publicly to the world on January 23rd, 1979. On that day, the so-called God Squad, an executive committee, met to decide the fate of the Teleco Dam, the latest and what would prove to be the last in a series of controversial dam projects that have punctuated the history of American conservation thought and politics. At that time, the uh, controversy surrounded the snail darter, that little fish you see there, which was found in the waters of the Little Tennessee River and became the first big test of the new Endangered Species Act. So the God Squad is meeting. It's a public meeting. Robert K. Davis, an environmental economist, gives the staff report on its benefit-cost analysis. He sits down. Who will speak next? Charles Schultz, chief of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, clears his throat. An audible gasp comes from the back of the room from the environmental lobby, <laughs> not the economist. But what Schultz had to say that day surprised them. He said, look, the benefit-cost ratios for this project were always iffy at best, at best. If you give any weight to that fish at all, it should sink the project. And a motion soon carries to let the project die, at least for the time being. And for the if not for the first time, at least in a very real and very public way, the environmental lobby saw that economics could be on their side. It could be on the side of the natural environment. The story I want to tell today is the story of how that came to be and why it was such a surprise to them that day, why they gasped when Schultz spoke. A key figure in this story, the, the main person I'm going to build up to, is this chap, uh, John Crutilla an economist at Resources for the, Future, for the Future from 1955 to 1988, who wrote a seminal, seminal article in the American Economic Review, one of the top economics journals, called Conservation Reconsidered in 1967, 50 years ago last year. The conference Eli mentioned was a celebration of that paper, uh, the 50th anniversary of it at Resources for the Future last year. Let's first set the stage, though for Crutilla's work on conservation reconsidered, um, with an important schism in the history of uh, American environmentalism, the split between the conservation side, represented by Yale's very own Gifford Pinchot, and the preservationist side, represented by John Muir. Pinchot, as you probably know, was a trained forester from a very privileged background. He graduated from Yale University in 1889 He's, he received uh, postgraduate training from the Ecole Nationale des Eaux et Forêts in France, making him one of America's first professionally trained foresters. He became, in 1898, the second chief of what was then the U.S. Division of Forestry, now the Forestry Service. In 1900, he founded the Society of American Foresters, and in the same year with his father, the Yale School of Forestry. Pinchot had a progressive vision for rational planning. It was based on an extended version of Jeremy Bentham's utilitarian maxim. Bentham's maxim was the, uh, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Pinchot's version was the greatest good to the greatest number for the longest time. All right, so that's the extended version. We're going to think about it 
over time, we're going to conserve things so we can get the greatest good for the longest time. That utilitarian vision, his version of it, was very materialistic as well as anthropocentric. Right? So not only putting human beings at the center of it and in, in, uh, making their judgment on what the good was, but it was a very materialistic version of what the good could be. It's interesting here that he subtly changed Bentham's version from greatest happiness to greatest good. He said, quote, there are just two things on this material earth, people and natural resources. People and natural resources, that's, that's it. Those are the two things on this earth. His motto was the wise use of natural resources. Wise, that meant um, rational planning. You couldn't trust things to the higgly piggly of the market. We need a, a rational approach um, to managing our resources. That's the wise part. But it's wise use, and the use part means that we have to use resources. Resources are there, are there to be used. They're resources. We have to use them for some purpose. Now, John Muir was Pinchot's opposite. He moved with his family from Scotland to Wisconsin when he was a child. His father was a nearly illiterate farmer with an Orthodox Christian faith with whom he never got along. There was a lot of tension there in the family. He showed some early academic progress, uh, promise. He took courses at the University of Wisconsin, but just didn't have the funds to um, get through any degrees. He worked at a machine shop until an accident there left him blind for about a month. Uh, when he recovered, he decided life was just too short to do anything but live for his passion. So he hiked from Indiana there where he was to Florida, nearly 1,000 miles, and then uh, famously hiked the Sierra Nevada mountains where he um, fell in love with the, the natural beauty of the place and um, spent uh, his time on what would become the signature project of his life, conserving that area in, as what would become known as Yosemite National Park in 1890. Understanding the need to watch over this treasure, he also founded the Sierra Club uh, a couple years later in 1892 as a nascent political force for uh, the natural environment. In contrast to Pinchot's utilitarianism and materialism, Muir was a transcendentalist who reworked his orthodox Christian upbringing into a spiritual faith in nature. To Muir, leaves, rocks, and water bodies were sparks of the divine soul. Landscapes are paths to divinity. He said, quote, the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. That's the way to God in some sense. He was also explicitly anti-anthropocentric. He said, no dogma taught by the present civilization seems to form so insufferable an obstacle in the way of a right understanding of the relations which culture sustains to wildness as that which declares that the world was made especially for the uses of man. Right? That's the big obstacle for getting along with nature, the idea that nature is for the uses of man. Not true. Uh, to the contrary, Nature has an intrinsic value. And intrinsic meant a couple things here, it seems. So he wasn't explicit about this, but there are at least a couple senses in which nature has intrinsic value to Muir. First, its value could be non-instrumental. We don't have to ask what, what is something to be used for. Uh, second of all, it could have an objective value independent of human opinion or human appraisal. Right? It wasn't, it's not our call what the value of nature is. Okay. It's just got its own value. So he was asked once, well, what's the value of a rattlesnake? And he bristled at this as if we could know God's ways. He said, well, its value is that it's good, at, give it good for itself. We don't need to begrudge it for its, for its life and for what it has to live for itself. Now, Muir and Pinchot were at first uh, tactical allies. They held each other in mutual respect, at least initially. And they were tactical allies against what they saw as the excesses of laissez-faire, which Muir once called the gobble-gobble school of economics. <laughs> I really like that, because I think it, he said, it gobbles everything up, but it also is maybe talking gibberish, <laughs> in his view. Uh, but then they clashed over a series of specific policy recommendations. So first, the National Academy of Sciences was asked in 1891 to make recommendations on how to dispose of the nation's first forest reserves. They were on that committee together. They thought they were going to get along. It turns out they, they didn't so much. Pinchot 
wanted wise use of those forest resources. Right? We were going to have sustainable harvest. Muir thought, no, we were going to preserve this in its wild state, like Yosemite. And they uh, ended up moving against each other in, in uh, the political debates. Uh, Pinchot ended up winning that one. Uh, the definitive break, though, came in their fight over the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Muir's beloved Yosemite. In 1906, after its devastating fire, San Francisco petitioned to dam the valley in the Yosemite for, as a source for municipal water supply, about, about 100 some miles away from the city. There then ensued a seven year fight over whether or not San Francisco was gonna be allowed to do this. So even 110 years ago, these decisions took a long, took a long time. Pinchot, in thinking about this, looked to kind of a, a primitive sort of benefit cost analysis. Right? He's not quantifying everything, but he says, well, yes, taken in of itself, it's a really beautiful spot, and I understand all that. But the city of San Francisco's need here is overwhelming, and we can't stand in the face of that need. That's progress for the city, and we're going to have to dam it so we can get that water. Right? Use, the, use the resources for people, and this is people's need. Muir and his Sierra Club allies, of course, thought differently. They emphasized its spiritual significance. Dam Hetch Hetchy, he exclaimed in the, the last uh, closing words of one of his books, and there's all sorts of puns here on dam with and without an N, right? Dam Hetch Hetchy, as well dam for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. It's got this spiritual significance. You just can't think about using it for water supplies. It's beyond that. The clash between um, Muir and Pinchot here extended even to the very meaning of what the word conservation meant. They had arguments about the vocabulary. Pinchot claimed to have coined the term, and historians have doubted whether that's really right, but he claimed it, that this was his term, and this, therefore he had the right to define what it meant. And what it meant was wise use of resources for people, with emphasis on for people. And he characterized Muir as wanting to preserve or lock up resources from people. For people versus from people is the way Pinchot would put it. Muir didn't like that kind of vocabulary. His view was that, okay, Pinchot's wise use is one perspective, but the preservation side, that's another side. Those are two sides of the coin of conservation. That's the way Muir's side would put it. Now, to some extent, we can view the clash between Muir and Pinchot here as a clash of values. What did they value? Pinchot valued the extractive uses of natural resources, timber and so on, from forests, and Muir preferred preservation in wild state for natural beauty in the wilderness. And to some extent, that's, that's part of it. But that doesn't capture all the clash. Pinchot himself loved natural beauty. He often talked about uh, how overwhelmed he was by the beauty of the places he visited. He went into forestry as propitiation uh, for the damage that his family forestry business had done earlier. So there's some love there of beauty. He recognized natural beauty. Muir frequently conceded the need for timber and other um, kinds of harvesting of resources. So the difference in values can't be all of it. Um, historians have argued that their debate was as much about a vision of politics as it was about values. Muir's political approach was a kind of civic republicanism in which we have to debate what the good is through discourse with Tocquevillian mediating institutions like the Sierra Club. Given his Christian upbringing, uh, a reasonable comparison might be to something like the Sierra Club, uh, its role in politics would be to the role of churches and religion historically um, in American Republican discourse. Right, setting up the good, defining what is the dignity of humanity or, and natural rights and so on, and then having organizations through which we, we work. Pinchot had a different kind of uh, liberal model. He had this model, as I've emphasized, of rational planning and calculation in which spiritual values, religious or natural, belong to a realm of private feeling and have to be shutted off. There has to be a wall of separation between those kinds of spiritual private feelings and public discourse. There's no room there when we uh, bring rationality to our decision making. He said, quote, uh, this is uh, in his testimony to Congress in the debate over Hetch Hetchy. He said, quote, the fundamental principle of the whole conservation policy 
Remember, he gets to define what conservation means. The whole fundamental principle is that of use, to take every part of the land and its resources and put it to that use in which it serves the most people. So when you define it that way, what else can conservation decide but to, to use a, a resource like Hetch Hetchy for something like water? Since love of nature and wilderness is practically by definition omitted from a rational utilitarian calculus, the way Pinchot thinks of it, then that the calculus leads inevitably to the decision to develop a resource. Now, it was reaction against such a dissatisfying dichotomy, this debate between Pinchot and Muir left us, that led Futilla to develop some of his ideas. And he developed it explicitly against um, this history in the, as, as a background. His goal was to reconcile the anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism of economics with the intrinsic value of wilderness that a, that a Muir would, would love. But he was not the first to wrestle with this, the problem of this dichotomy that was left. I'm going to talk about two more steps in the history. The first brings in uh, some economists. And I want to start um, bringing in the economists with work on benefit cost analysis of dam projects that began after the 1936 Flood Control Act, since you have to do these, these benefit cost analyses. Economists in government started getting together on, well, how are we going to do this? What's the frame? What are the benefits going to be? How do we, you know, what kind of intellectual framework are we going to bring to it? The key benefit categories were the ones you might think of, right? Hydroelectric power was at the top of the list, irrigation for farming, reclamation, navigation, flood control, and so on. So that was at the top of the list of benefits of why we would do these water projects. But, as always, there's bureaucratic pressure for more building, right? And so the bureaucrats came to the economists and said, look, basically, there are memos that are subtle and there are memos that are quite bald on this. We need you to get the benefit cost ratios up so we can build more projects, okay? Subtle or explicit, that was the, the message. And so one idea was, well, can we come up with some more benefit categories? What about outdoor recreation? We build these dams, we get reservoirs, and then people can go boating on them and fishing on them. What if we added uh, recreation as a, uh, another benefit category? It's not at the top of the list, but it's an add-on. Uh, interestingly, they also uh, discovered very recently that with, uh, at, at the time, they, they were quick to learn that with reclamation projects, there was a rule that farmers had to pay um, uh, the cost of the project um, when they collected the water, but you could net out benefits to other purposes. So if you could also bring up the recreation benefits of a lake, then that was less that the farmers had to pay. So the recreation benefits not only got the benefit cost ratios up, but it was a kind of farmer aid which is always popular in Washington, it was in the, the 30s and 40s as well. So anyway, can we bring in recreation benefits? That's the idea here. Uh, we're getting into the late 1940s at this point, and economists don't know what to do. These recreation benefits are really hard to figure out. How can we bring them into the benefit cost ratio? Uh, the Park Service, National Park Service, was tasked with figuring this out. and. The economists worked on it for a little while. They couldn't figure out. And they said, well, let's just assume that the benefits from recreation are equal to the costs of jiggering the project a little bit more for the recreation benefits. And this didn't suit the bureaucrats at all, right? Because you're just averaging in one into the benefit cost ratio. Or you're diluting the benefit cost ratio, not improving it. And they were given this message. So then they said, fine, we'll assume the benefits are two times the cost and just put that into the benefit cost ratio. <laughs> Uh, that was a little too cynical, even for Washington. Uh, that was not gonna. That was not gonna fly. Uh, so again, back to the drawing board. Come up with a better way to do this. And so, uh, in 1948 to 49, a park economist named Roy Pruitt surveyed uh, 12 economists. I think it's 12, somewhere around in that ballpark. And 11 out of 12 economists said, "You can't do it. Can't do it. Can't be done. Don't try." Uh, interestingly, for those of you, if, or for the economists here, the one holdout who said you can do it was Harold Hortelling, who came up with the suggestion of the travel cost model that's basically used for these kinds of recreation benefits today. But at the time, this was treated as this curiosity that was bizarre, and so he was put aside. That seems ridiculous. We're not going to do that. And so 
after this survey, Pruitt went through everything and talked to their own internal economists, and they said, yeah, we, we can't do it. And in uh, his uh, conclusion, his recommendations, Pruitt wrote this. Recreation is, first of all, an intangible, a service. It is not a standardized or homogenous service. It varies with every individual, and it cannot be considered separate and apart from the individual. It is of the mind and body. It cannot be stored and transported. It is a psychic value, and it, ca it cannot be measured in objective terms. Finally, the recreational values supplied by the National Park Service are not sold for a price under marketplace rules. It might be better to forget the words economic value of recreation and focus attention on the expenditures induced by recreation. It is in this area that no, an objective approach can be made. And that's what they end up doing. They go around and surveying how much people spend. Uh, when they go to the park, you know, they, they rent bait and tackle and they spend 50 cents for that. They rent a camping space and stuff like that. And th those are gonna be the values and they're gonna think about this more sort of uh, some kind of Keynesian multiplier effects in the local economy. That's the, the, the approach they're gonna take. Now notice Pruitt's saying two things here and this is, this is a good distillation of, of the comments he got. There are two problems with the task they have of trying to put benefits on recreation. One is that what, recreation is first of all an intangible a service, right? It's of the, the mind, it's a spiritual, some of the letter writers said spiritual, right? It's a spiritual value, like Muir talked about. That's a problem. That's not a sufficiently enough, that by itself that wouldn't be uh, sufficient to say we can't do it. There are a lot of things that are that way. And then the example was brought up about what, what, what about going to a symphony? That's of the mind and spirit, right? Listening to Beethoven. But there is a market for that, right? And we see what people are willing to pay when they buy tickets for these concerts or recordings. Um, so then we got the second problem here. Uh, recreational values supplied by the service are not sold for a price. Right, so we also don't have a market. We have this non-market valuation problem and it's a psychic thing. The two of them together made it seemingly an impossible task. One or the other would have been okay. So interestingly, there were some other discussions, some other suggestions that were made around this time. Of, well, what, what could you do? You could think about how when people go out to the wilderness for camping or something, and come back on Monday, they, from the rest, they're gonna be more productive workers. And we could look at their increased productivity on the job after their, their trip, and maybe that's how we could infer the values of, of recreation. Interesting that those suggestions were all on the, the production, physical side, not the consumerist enjoyment side. Anyway, they said it couldn't be done. More dissatisfaction, right? Wrestling with the problem but we don't know what to do. We just can't bring in these spiritual values into the economic calculus. It's what the economists are saying. And they're dragged, in. they don't want to do it, they're dragged into it by the bureaucrats. My last chapter here before um, getting to Portilla himself, um, another a distinguished alum of Yale, Aldo Leopold. Leopold knew he wanted to be a forester at an early age. He ended up following uh, Pinchot's footsteps quite closely. He went to a preparatory school specifically to prepare to get into Yale. Um, and then uh, and he wanted to, the, the Yale school, it was the Yale school forestry he wanted to do, it was recently founded by the Pinchot family. He arrived here uh, four years later, taking courses in uh, the Sheffield Scientific School, which I think doesn't exist anymore, right? The Sheffield Scientific School. Um, because the, the forestry school is just a graduate program. So he took classes there to prepare for his graduate work in the Yale Forestry School. And there he got a very interdisciplinary education, as, as you all know uh, very well. Even then it was that way. He got a little bit of economics and ben Benthamite utilitarianism in his training. And then he began to work uh, at the US Forest Service in 1909 at a time when it was headed by Pinchot himself. Later, uh, to get ahead a little bit, uh, in 1933, he became a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics, a professor of uh, game management at the University of Wisconsin in the Department of Agricultural Economics. My point here is we're not gonna, you know, it's the height of uh, praise from an economist to call someone an economist. We won't call Leopold an economist, he's not, of course. But he has this very interdisciplinary background. He has training in economics, and then he becomes a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics. That's, that's an important part of the, the story here. So he's right there in that, that world. Uh, in 35, he co-founded the Wilderness Society with Benton Mackay and Bob Marshall and others. 
And then, of course, in 1949, his most famous book, uh, Sand County Almanac, uh, was published posthumously. Those, those of you who are under 40, how many of you have read Sand, Sand County Almanac? Okay, that's good. This would be the place, right? I'm amazed at how many people are not reading it now. It's getting disturbing for me. Um, so he literally was following um, Pinchot's footsteps. And uh, he took that point of view initially in his career. He really emphasized the extractive values of forestry. Um, and then he slowly, slowly starts shifting position. So then he begins to emphasize the non-consumptive uses of uh, forest resources like uh, recreation. That by itself is not that remarkable. The Forest Service is moving to uh, multi-purpose planning. And he continued to approach that very much in the mindset of a, of a manager optimizing things. Uh, yet eventually he became disillusioned with even that way of thinking. And the decisive moment, as he's described uh, very beautifully, was this, this moment when they, they killed a wolf. Right? They were exterminating wolves because they interfere with the game. He killed a wolf and they went up to it uh, at close range and he, he describes uh, very poetically how he saw the, the fierce green fire dying in her eyes. And he knew instinctively at that point that he had left something out of all his calculations. So in, in some degree, we could say that he moves over the course of this time from Pinchot's side of the spectrum to Muir's. But he didn't just shift positions in an existing intellectual landscape. He also helped mold a new landscape intellectually. He's very dissatisfied with the Pinchot-Muir dichotomy. He argues that Pinchot, on one hand, ignores the very real intrinsic values of nature that he saw in those fierce green eyes. On the other hand, Muir, and sort of locking up wilderness from people, if you would agree with Pinchot's evaluation of it, left human beings out of his calculus. And human beings and nature have to get along together. Human beings are animals too. We're part of nature and we have a human nature. How can we all live together? That's the, quest, that's the question Leopold wants to ask and uh, spends his whole life working on. He also argued that while Pinchot left nature out of his calculus, his scientific calculus, Muir in using the spiritual transcendentalist language left out science altogether. We need to bring in uh, science in a way, human science and natural science in a way that can reconcile all these things. And so he proposes a new um, land ethic. Basically he turns, if he turns to one science, it's to the, to the newer science of ecology as a third way, but it's really more of an interdisciplinary approach. A new land ethic it's, quote, a universal symbiosis with land, economic, and aesthetic, public, and private. At the end of his career at Wisconsin, he proposed a new project in ecological economics. That was the term he used that would be more interdisciplinary. It was based on the premise that, quote, industrialization is now bringing on a worldwide conflict between economics and conservation, he called ecology, he says. A conflict between economics and ecology. We need to overcome that impasse. It's telling here that he views it as a conflict between economics and ecology. That's the tension as he frames it. And it, coming out of the Pinchot-Muir debate, it's natural to think about it that way. So he's, he's around all these economists and he thinks about what economists would have to say and he's not very pleased with what economists would have to say about environmental uh, values, the intrinsic values of nature. He wrote in Sand County Almanac, sometimes in June when I see unearned dividends of dew hung on every lupin, those are lupins there, hung on every lupin, I have doubts about the real poverty of the sands. On solvent farmlands, lupins do not even grow, much less collect a daily rainbow of jewels. If they did, the weed control officer who seldom sees a dewy dawn would doubtless insist they be cut. I wonder, do economists even know about lupins? They just don't value these things. Then he goes on to say, one basic weakness in a conservation system based wholly on economic motives is that most members of the land community have no economic value. Wildflowers and songbirds are examples. Of the 22,000 higher plants and animals native to Wisconsin, it is doubtful whether more than 5% can be sold, fed, eaten, or otherwise put to economic use. Yet these creatures are members of the biotic community. And if, as I believe, its stability depends on its integrity, they are entitled to its continuance. When one of these non-economic categories, 
say that again, non-economic categories is threatened, and if we happen not to love it, we invent subterfuges to give it economic importance. At the beginning of the century, songbirds were supposed to be disappearing. Ornithologists jumped to the rescue with some distinctly shaky evidence to the effect that insects would eat us up if birds failed to control them. The evidence had to be economic in order to be valid. What's he saying here? Basically, these arguments of ecosystem services are kind of pathetic, right? That we, we want to have some excuse to protect the environment. We turn to ecosystem services. They're kind of lame arguments, and it's just not very satisfying because really maybe these birds didn't have this instrumentalist utilitarian use. They're like, like the rattlesnake that you were talked about. They're just good enough themselves. <laughs> Leopold did think economics was important because incentives matter. Incentives matter. We need to get property rights institutions right. Um, people are going to be interacting with the environment. We want it to be done in a good way. That's where the economists come in on the design of those institutions. But coming up with arguments for why to protect the environment, what the benefits are, no. That's not going to work. All right, that brings me finally uh, to my hero here, the economist John Crutilda, Crutilla. If Leopold's move was to wed the romanticism of an Emerson and a Muir to the science of ecology, it was Crutilla who tries to wed it <laughs> very improbably to the science of economics. Crutilla loved the outdoors. He was an advocate of wilderness. Anytime he got a grant for some uh, research project, he took it as an opportunity to go on a field trip check out the resource, go camping and hiking and canoeing at, at whatever place it was. Uh, he had a cam, ca he was working in DC, he had a cabin in Shenandoah. He read Muir and Leopold. He was a friend of naturalists like uh, Margaret Nolas Murray. He eventually became a trustee of the Environmental Defense Fund and Leopold's Wilderness Society. And he was instrumental in the founding of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists in the mid 1970s. He got his PhD from Harvard in economics, Harvard economics in 1952, studying regional economics and development. He worked at the T Tennessee Valley Authority at TVA for three years, and then moved to RFF in 1955, where he spent the rest of his career until he retired in 1988. His early work I would characterize as a successful but conventional application of benefit cost analysis to water projects like dams and so on. It was frequently published in uh, very applied journals like land economics and so on. He got a couple top hits in economics like the Journal of Political Economy and others. Um, but it was basically conventional stuff looking at it. Uh, his most notable piece in the early part of his career was a book co-authored with Otto Eckstein at Harvard called Multiple Purpose River Development. It was a cutting edge application of benefit cost analysis to uh, river development questions, to dam building, looking at uh, uh, lumpiness in investments, looking at problems in capital markets and various things like that. A lot of innovations there, and it was a widely cited um, book at the time. There's the theoretical part, and then they did, um, I think it was four case studies. One of the case studies was the Hell's Canyon Dam in the Snake River, which is a very important uh, chapter in the history of uh, American conservationism. Uh, there was a big fight there between uh, two versions of uh, water resource development. There was a New Deal planning version championed by the Army Corps of Engineers, which would uh, entail building uh, one big dam. And then there was a, a pro-business version led by local utilities championed by the Republicans that would have uh, a sm three smaller dams. And there was a big political fight over this. And uh, it was more about which vision of development, not development versus no development. Uh, the th it was the three dam project that won, and they took a look at this, they evaluated it, and they said, well, actually, the, the one, the Army Corps project was probably more efficient, but actually a hypothetical two dam project in between <laughs> would have been uh, best of all. What's interesting about this uh, examination of the, the Hell's Canyon is that uh, they mentioned, well, what about the, the natural beauty of it? We might lose if we dam it. And they, they treated, they had a little footnote on that. And they said, yeah, that's a consideration. But that's what they called an extra economic consideration. That's outside economics. Given the debates we've talked about, it's not surprising that economists would still be thinking that way in the late 1950s. It's a, it's a value, quote, in addition to economic efficiency. Something to consider, but it's not economics. 
but we're not going to talk about it. In the middle 1960s, uh, Krutila seems to have deliberately pivoted to, d to uh, address that deficiency. He began taking a series of courses along with his wife, offered by the USDA and others on ecology, soil science, and so forth, to, to learn more about uh, what the issues are in the natural environment, and to try to think about how we could bring that into economics. And the fruits of that work appeared in this 1967 essay, Conservation Reconsidered. These are some of the opening words of uh, that essay. He said, quote, the traditional concerns of conservation economics, the husbanding of natural resource stocks for the use of future generations. What's he, what are you talking about here? This is Pinchot, right? This is Pinchot. Conservation, the traditional husbanding, husbanding of natural resource stocks for future use. Those traditional concerns may now be outmoded by advances in technology. On the other hand, the central issue seems to be the problem of providing for the present and future the amenities associated with unspoilt natural environments. When the existence of a grand scenic wonder or a unique and fragile ecosystem is involved, its preservation and continued availability are a significant part of the real income of many individuals. What individuals? But note, by this I mean the spiritual descendants of John Muir, the present members of the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, and others to whom the loss of a species or the disfigurement of a scenic area causes acute distress and a sense of genuine relative impoverishment. Okay, so uh, for the economists here who do know this, or others who do know this essay, Conservation Reconsidered, the conservation he's reconsidering is Gifford Pinchot's conservation. Right? That's what he's reconsidering. He says it's time to rethink that. We need to figure out how to bring in the preservation side of the coin. He brings in three, three uh, main, he makes a lot of points in this essay, but I'll highlight three. The overarching point he wants to make is that there are opportunity costs. There are opportunity costs in the world. We can choose to develop a resource or we can preserve it, but you can't do both. It's one or the other. If you develop the resource, then that, that, comes, up, that comes at the opportunity cost of its preserved state. If you keep it preserved, then you can't develop it. Right? And that's an economic choice. That's an economic choice. So economics has to have a role to play here. It's Grutilla's way of thinking. And the love of nature counts. If we develop a resource, we give that up, and that's a real cost to the spiritual descendants of John Muir, as he put it in that quote. They give up something that's of real value to them. Then his other arguments are more um, empirical. Within that basic overarching point, he argues that, in fact, the preservation side of that trade-off is getting more important over time and the conservation side less important. Why is that? Well, first of all, there's asymmetric technical change. We're coming up with new and better ways to find substitutes for the material inputs in uh, material production. We don't need to dig up the land to get coal as much anymore because we're coming up with solar and wind energy and things like that. Right? Better substitutes for the material inputs. On the other side, the value of the natural environment is in, uh, and in its wilderness state is increasing over time. Its supply, if you will, is decreasing because every time we develop, every time we pave paradise, we lose that paradise, we can't get it back. It's irreversible. And then there's also the problem of the public good nature of natural environments. There's no way that the markets can capture all the value to people of the beauty of nature, and so not all the value gets counted by markets, and it gets shortchanged in economic decision making. Uh, then we have, at the same time, an increasing demand. We're getting richer, and so we like uh, luxuries, like enjoying the natural environment. And there's some kind of learning by doing. In, uh, in as we go camping and hiking, we get better at it, and we learn to appreciate it more. And so there's kind of this, this virtuous cycle where we love nature more and more the more we the more we do it. Shortly after he writes that uh, article, the debate in the Hell's Canyon um, comes back. The Hell's Canyon debate comes back. This actually started a little bit earlier, right around the time his book with Otto Eckstein was published. In 1957, Pacific Northwest Power, which was this consortium of several private utilities in the Northwest, proposed another dam downstream of the, the dams that were built earlier and evaluated in their book. 
at something called the High Mountain Sheep Site. And then one big utility in the area, Washington Public Power, proposed a rival project nearby. And then the Department of the Interior said, no, 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 we're going to do a big public project. Three rival projects, all for the same area. The Federal Power Commission had to adjudicate this. They ruled in favor of the Pacific Northwest Power Plan. Then there were lawsuits and counter lawsuits among all these parties, and it went to the Supreme Court. And in 1967, in a case called Udall versus the Federal Power Commission, the court ruled, um, made a landmark decision in a conservation policy that we can't just look at which plan is best in the public interest when the, the, the enabling legislation for, uh, for developing water resources talks about, what the pub about, the public, about what's in the public interest. We need to think about that broadly and not just which plan, but whether any plan should be. You can't just assume they meant the most possible um, dams. What's the, the right limit on the number of dams? What is the public interest? We need to look at the, the natural values of the site. And there's nothing about that in the record. So remand it back to reconsider everything, restudy the whole problem again, considering the natural values. Crutilla enters as a friend of the commission, testifying as an expert witness, and brings his arguments from conservation reconsider to bear, along with some new work by his colleagues, Tony Fisher and Charlie Cicchetti at AER, junior colleagues of, uh, excuse me, at Resources for the Future, junior colleagues of, of his. And they make this argument. Here on this axis, we have time. This, and, and on this axis, we have the, the state of development, how much development we have of our natural resources. This thick, chunky line here would be the optimal level of development if we could choose what it would be at each point in time without any dynamic constraint. And if it was reversible. So maybe we have some boom times in the economy and we want a lot of development. And then maybe we have some busts in the economy, some recessions, and we'd want to say, actually, we didn't need all that development after all. And if we could, we'd take it back. And we get these cycles like this. But of course, we can't take it back. Development is, is irreversible. We can't unpave paradise. And so therefore, what we would do in this case is we would smooth out these cycles with these uh, flat lines. Right? So we'd under underdevelop it first, knowing that, that we don't want that much. And we, and we would just kind of rest here and then take it up to there and so on. So we want to smooth out these downward cycles. But then we come back to his empirical point. The value for natural environments are increasing over time. The value of development is decreasing over time. So in fact, what we really have is not just trends, but a secular decrease in the value. And so therefore, what? We're done. We have what in programming we'd call a bang-bang solution. We have a level of development now, and then no more in the future. We should be preserving our natural environments. Okay, now, that's an extreme argument, but that's, that's the, the basic uh, rhetoric that they that they, they bring to bear. There's an argument for preserving more. We could always develop later if we, we need to. Crutilla is bringing in economics and defense of preserving the natural environment in a way that Pinchot couldn't imagine, nor Leopold, nor those, nor those economists in the 30s and 40s. What changed? What changed from that earlier work to what Crutilla could imagine in the 1960s? Three important things, I think. First of all, a new kind of post-war environmental politics, where it wasn't just about the environment as a, a productive good, but a new kind of aesthetic consumptive good. A new kind of consumptive good, sort of like David Brooks's Bobos in Paradise or something like that, right? Where we can enjoy, we have this aesthetic of enjoying these things. That's the new ethic of the environmental movement in the, the post-war period. And it's interesting that we really started calling it environmentalism during that time period. It wasn't that before the war, it's preservation and conservation. Uh, also, new bureaucratic management of preservation. So as a, as a simple example, uh, game wardens right, change out their shing shing shingles uh, to, to uh, save uh, to, to be the wildlife uh, manager. Also, in economics, there's new work on non-market valuation and uh, stated preference, ways of using surveys and other methods to try to get the value that people have for natural environments. Go back to that debate over recreation for dam building, that's where all that work started. 
was a continuation of that dilemma that the government economists were wrestling with in the 1940s. They brought in stated preference surveys as a new way to uh, measure those recreation values, but once that's developed, you could, you could say, well, this could be a way that we could bring in some of the John Muir type wilderness values as well, what we call existence values or non-market values as well. You could see how that becomes an option once you have these measurement techniques. And lastly, and I think most importantly, the biggest change is how economists began to define what their discipline was. So it was in the 1930s that Lionel Robin proposed the definition that economists would generally give today for their, for their discipline in textbooks, which is something like um, the, the coming together of uh, scarce resources that could be used for competing ends. Basically, economics as the study of opportunity costs. When Robbins proposed that in the 1930s, he recognized that this was a revolu revolutionary new definition. He called it an analytical definition. It's a way of thinking, the economic way of thinking, we sometimes say. And he contrasted it to what came before in textbooks, which was what he called classificatory definitions. So Alfred Marshall, the great British economist from the, the late 1800s, had defined economics in his Principles of Economics as the business of ordinary life. He went on to talk about that. He basically classified topics as this is about economics, that's about economics. It wasn't a particular way of thinking. You could have Marxist economics and historical schools of economics and neoclassical economics, but it's about these topics, about going to work, getting money, meeting the material needs of life, that kind of stuff. Robbins changed that. But Robbins' definition, when he proposed it in the 1930s, was not accepted you know, immediately. It's not like everyone said, oh, that's right, we're gonna change our way of thinking. It took time. And historians who have looked at this have basically um, found that it was in the 1960s that that way of thinking about what economics means really uh, took hold in the profession of economics itself. That's what started getting written into the textbooks. And you can see uh, this in other moves in economics. So for uh, example, at the University of Chicago around this time that Kutil is writing, the famous economist Gary Becker starts doing a new kind of labor economics where you could talk about the economics of the family, decisions within the household, whether or not you should work or raise kids, economics of crime and things like this, all sorts of crazy things that would not have counted as economics um, before economics is defined as opportunity costs. But there are opportunity costs with those things, so, so why not study them? Kutila's move is at the same time. When we think about economics as the study of opportunity costs, it allows us to change our way of thinking. It doesn't have to be economics versus the environment to remember was the way Leopold phrased it. There's a tension between economics and ecology or economics and the environment. It's not about that anymore. Can you read this? I've got here on a graph uh, what we would call production possibility frontier, showing a trade-off, basically, a rate at which you can trade off between the natural environment and economics. You might think of it that way if economics means material wealth. But if economics, that's, and that's the way, say, a Leopold is thinking about it. So there's a tension between the two. But if economics is not about material wealth, if economics is about making trade-offs, then we take economics off the axis here and rename it material wealth, and then economics is sort of the title of the whole graph. We can have an economics of the environment instead of an economics versus the environment. And that's the move that Crutillo wants to make. And that's why his role in the founding of environmental economics is so important. There are real values here, there are opportunity costs, and economics can help us decide. Now, would a John Muir have been satisfied with Krutilla's move? Maybe partly. He can bring in intrinsic values of the environment in, in one sense. They don't have to be instrumental anymore. If you just love rattlesnakes, songbirds, you don't have to, songbirds don't have to be eating up insects, you can just love a pretty bird, and, and that would be a real economic value. Kutila says, the spiritual, a value for the spiritual descendants of John Muir. So in that sense, we can have an intrinsic value in economics. It doesn't have to be narrowly instrumental. On the other hand, that second meaning of intrinsic value, who's making the call? It's still people making the call here. It's people who have to be valuing the songbirds or the rattlesnake or whatever it is, right? So to make an argument that there's some objective value outside human judgment or appraisal, 
economics can't really bring that in. It's, n it's always going to be about people making that trade-off. So maybe it's a half win for the John Ewers and the Leopolds. And with that, I'll thank you and take time for questions. Yeah, okay. I think we have, what, eight minutes? Something like that? No. Thanks, Spencer. Great yeah. talk. Just wanted to go right to where you ended there All at right. the end. And uh, and think if, if Muir might be a little bit less happy than it maybe seems in the sense that implicit I'm in that, uh, I'm putting on a different hat than I normally wear in this room, by the way, right now. But. Um, <laughs> And uh, wouldn't your sort of be like the idea of actually making trade-offs is what I sort of reject? In the sense that it used to be he appealed to sort of spiritual. What do you mean you reject? Muir would actually oh, say, Muir. Muir would say that the fact that we're willing to talk about trading this stuff off is a slippery slope and a problem that I don't think that we should enter. Would, it, would he say that, or would he just say, no, the right call is this, and so we have to sack, so we can't have the water for San Francisco? But he's not going to say we can have both. Yeah, but I guess it's uh, the idea of it. So he had kind of like a fundamentalist view about this stuff, and once you sort of go into the, the world of making the trade-offs, it sort of, it becomes, I mean, you said this at the end, it becomes yeah. like utilitarian. Yeah. And I just wonder if he'd be like, okay, well, balancing these different margins and striking the balance, yeah, that, that's one way that you could do it. But I actually think that we should really just fundamentally draw the line on certain things and not engage in that discussion at all. Right. I, I think you're probably right, yeah. That he, would, he would not be happy with uh, Crutilla's, he would not be satisfied with Crutilla's attempt to bring in the spiritual descendants of John Muir into economics. That was what Crutilla wanted to do. I think you're right. I don't think Muir would have been satisfied with, for that reason, because it's still, I mean, and that's the point about it's human beings making the call, right? It's human beings making the call then, and, and it should be something else. It should be God in some sense. Not, not the Christian God, but the author of creation. Yes, sir, over here. Yep. Uh, thinking along those similar lines, uh, there's a point to be made that the axes of the environment and material wealth are fundamentally different and don't have a lowest common denominator of happiness, or maybe, maybe Muir's thinking would be something along those lines, that happiness isn't the right scale to, me to make the decision about trade-offs. Right. That's. I mean, that's when you when you're uh, making the trade-off, you're putting them into some scale, and you're saying, um, right, there has to be some kind of a, a common currency, right? You're saying that they're um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, reconcilable. That's not the word. Uh, commensurable. They're commensurable in some in some way. Where he he might argue, no, there's there's a, there's a fundamental incommensurability here. And there are other economists who are wrestling with that issue around the same time that I've written on in some other works. So economists who would have said that, yes, <laughs> there are trade-offs, of course, um, but we'll never be able to do something like non-market valuation, where we say this is already in dollars, where we put this in dollars. It, we can't do that. What we can do as economists and, uh, and in, in really in interdisciplinary teams with natural scientists and engineers and others, depending on what the question is, is to, to find what the rate of trade-off is, right? how many fish have to die if we get so much hydroelectric power or whatever, figure out what that is, and then bring in that, that, that view that Muir was closer to of a kind of a civic republicanism, republic as in a republic, right? civic republicanism of, in which we then turn it over to the political process to, to debate, and, and we'll make some kind of social choice, oh, we should be here, no, we should be there, we'll make some kind of choice out of that political process um, that's not based on rational calculation, benefit cost analysis, anything like that. And then, and then once we have a sense of what the priorities are, maybe we can come back as planners and plan projects in that direction. 
That was another view of how to reconcile these trade-offs at the time. So how does this, how do you see this framework kind of dealing with the issue, the bureaucratic issue that you brought up earlier of there being a strong desire for forces to weigh heavy on one end of the scale, right? How does, how does he approach that? Or does he talk about that, that conflict? Um, it's interesting. I'm just reading a little bit about what he wrote about that. I, I think he was, he was pretty optimistic on the objectivity of economic science to be able to inform this and people to, and, and for bureaucrats to listen to that. Maybe I, in my judgment, uh, maybe naively so. Um, it's very interesting though, the way uh, these kinds of uh, bureaucratic pressures have, have changed and the shifting alliances that you, you have. Um, in, uh, uh, this is going off in a, in a different direction though, but it's, um, how can I put this? Um, one is surprised looking back at the history at how often environmentalists and Republicans, to, to be frank, um, had alliances against New Deal planning, right? Because it was the New Deal lefties who wanted to build big dams and stuff like that. And the Republicans wanted to kill these government projects for their own reasons, uh, their laissez-faire reasons. And the environmentalists wanted to kill the projects because they were bad for the environment. So until the 1970s, the mindset is that um, government is the bad guy if you're an environmentalist. Uh, so for example, um, uh, you uh, get all this pressure from the environmentalists lobbying to have higher discount rates. So the environmentalists are lobbying the government to increase the discount rates, which if you know anything about these debates now is not what they would say, right? They want lower discount rates so we can value climate in the, in the distant future and, and so forth. They wanted higher discount rates to kill dam projects because dams are also big costs up front. You, build, you have to build the thing and then the hydroelectric power or whatever out into the future for many years and if you could raise the discount. So Ralph Nader leads this huge write-in campaign to, to raise the discount rate in government benefit cost analysis in the early 1970s. So, so you get shifting alliances in these politics that are, that are pretty interesting too. said, but um, I'm just back to that question. I'm wondering about um, environmentalists, some of us in this room probably, who uh, kind of, you know, want, are willing to use the economics for environmental uh, preservation, really. Mm -hmm. um, is that maybe what, you're, would he have been someone who used it uh, if it was, if it gave the right outcome, I mean, even if he didn't believe it? And, and what do you... <laughs> You know, what do economists, uh, how do economists, how would Critilla have dealt with that? Like, uh, it's, 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 um, so my first, an my first instinct there is to dodge the question by saying it's so anachronistic that, I mean, it just wasn't what, economics couldn't do that then, right? It was economics versus the environment, really. Economics was always on the side of development. Um, so. So, so much of what he's reacting against is in a world where you just can't conceive of it that way. Right? Of course, Cordillo is trying to change that. So, and my second answer, this gets back to Matt's comment at the beginning, then my second answer is, well, if pressed, I'd say no, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't want to do that because that, that does then undermine that second sense of intrinsic where we don't want to put human beings in the driver's seat of making the call. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, Cordillo loved uh, uh, John Muir um, and Leopold and, and wanted to, to try to, and loved economics and wanted to reconcile them. I think he half did it because it is true that until Cotillo was really writing, economics was so narrowly uh, utilitarian or instrumentalist. The birds had to eat the insects before you could care about them. And, and he was part of changing that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.